صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا ابن رسول الله يا مظلوم يا غريب بكربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما صلى الله محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن علومك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما My brothers and my sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وذا النون إذ ذهب مغاضبا In the Quran Allah سبحانه وتعالى refers to the Prophet Yunus he says, وَذَانْ نُونَ نُون, وَذَانْ نُونَ means the one of the fish, the one of the whale. As we know the story of the whale. وَذَانْ نُونَ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا He left. He left the town whilst he was angry. غَضَب مُغَاضِبًا He was bringing people to the path of Allah and they weren't listening. He became frustrated. He was angered. He left the town and he boarded a ship. And he went on this journey into the middle of the ocean on this ship. And the people on this ship had a problem. They had to relieve the ship of its weight. And they chose Yunus to be the weight that they were to relieve. So they threw him off the ship. This is a true story. <laughs> okay, I know it sounds so peculiar. So Allah is mentioning this in the Quran. They throw him off of the ship. Now this prophet of God, Yunus, is in the middle of the sea. In the middle of the sea. There's nowhere to go. The ship leaves. He's just trying to stay afloat so he can breathe. And a whale swallows him. A whale comes to shore and swallows this man. Now I want you to truly take yourself into the whale now. Because you must have come across this story so many times. But this is not Pinocchio. And this is not the life of Pi. This is real. Take yourself into the whale. Now, Yunus is inside the whale. It didn't bite him. He's inside. So he's inside. He can smell the stench. The saliva. He's sitting down. In this whale, you can't see a thing, pitch black. وَذَانْ نُونَ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَادِبًا 
فَذَنَّ أَنْ لَنْ نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ So Allah says, ذَنَّ And ذَنَّ means, usually in Arabic, it means you think something is probable. But here, the way that Allah uses it in this ayah, it means that Yunus was of 100% certainty. In what? ذَنَّ أَنْ لَنْ لَنْ means never. لَمْ means it won't happen. But it's not never happen. It won't happen this time. He says, Len, Len, never. So he has 100% certainty that something will never happen. And Len, naqdira alayh. That Allah will not tighten his provision on him. That Allah won't tighten his sustenance. That even if I'm in this whale, Allah isn't going to leave me. Allah is going to take care of me. Even in this whale, he has 100% certainty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never leave him. So he called out in the darknesses. Dhulam is one darkness, Dhulamat is several. Imam al Rida alayhi salam. He says that Yunus was in the dhulumat, the dhulumat were three, three darknesses. Yunus was in the darkness of the whale. He couldn't see a thing. He called out in the darkness. He's calling out to Allah in the darkness of the whale. That's the first darkness. But even if he was to escape the first darkness, let's say he was able to escape the whale, he's still now in the middle of the sea, the second darkness. Imagine you escape the whale, but you you're in water, you still can't see anything. You might as well be in the whale, you can't see a thing. Imagine how scary that is. The second darkness, dhulumat. And even if he was able to swim up, to catch a breath, he is now encompassed by the darkness of the sky. Three darknesses. Fanada fil dhulumat. He called out in the darknesses, La ilaha illa anta subhanak. There is no Lord but you I am one of the oppressors I've oppressed myself They call this dhikr Dhikr Yunus Dhikr Yunusi The dhikr that you recite in desperation Is this Because there's no such desperate situation As being in the whale In the sea Encompassed by the darkness of the sky so Yunus called out, and La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al The same dhikr that we recite in our most desperate moments on Laylatul Qadr. Al Ghawth, Al Ghawth, right? Subhanak ya la ilaha illa ant. Al Ghawth, Al Ghawth, khalisna min al nar ya rab. That's where it comes from. It comes from this ayah. It's that Yunus said this. So you're saying, Ya Allah, we beg of you to have mercy on us. You're using the dhikr of Yunus, the dhikr of the three darknesses. But you just switched it. Instead of La ilaha illa anta subhanaka ya la ilaha illa ant. So Yunus says, And La ilaha illa anta subhanaka, he calls out in the middle of the darkness. Inni kuntu min al So Allah says, Fastajabna lahu. So we answered him. Wanajaynahu min al gham. And we saved him from the darknesses. Wa kadalika nunji al mu'minin. And that's how we save the believers, mu'minin, the people of Iman. Mu'mineen, Iman. Iman is the station that we're trying to reach. To be above only ilm. We're trying to get to Iman. Now my brothers, my sisters, many of us are going to be swimming in a sea of darkness throughout life. And on these nights, Allah says there's a ship that can save us. It's called Safinatun Najat. It's the ship of salvation. That's why he calls Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They call Imam Hussein Misbah al Huda, the lantern of guidance. But we sometimes don't do justice to the idea of Safinatun Najat or Misbah al Huda. We don't do justice to the fact that he is the ship of salvation and the lantern of guidance because we think that we can be whatever we want to be. And that the ship of salvation will save me. But that's not how this works. The ship of salvation doesn't save you just because you love the ship. 
That's not how it works. There are conditions to it. If Yunus did not call out and La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al why would Allah continue the ayah? Fastajabna lahu fa. That means that he did this, so I did this. Okay? Conditional. Yunus submitted, so I saved Yunus because I saved the believers. Many Shia unfortunately believe that all they have to do is love the Imams and love the Ahlul Bayt and they can do whatever else they want to do because Shafa'a. But that's disrespect to the Imam. That's not how it works. There's a condition to be of the people of the Imam. On the final day, each person is raised with their Imam. Some people are going to be raised with Donald Trump. That's the Imam. Literally. Some people will be raised with Hitler. That was the Imam of the Nazis. That's their Imam. We want to be raised with Imam Al Mahdi. We want to be raised with our Imam. Who, by the way, the other Imams, when they speak about him, they say they wish they could be amongst us to serve him, which usually does not work when it comes to the Imams in the hierarchy. But when it comes to Al Qa'im, they wish they were of the Shia. The last Shia, the ones who wait, the ones in intidhar, the Imams say, we wish we were of the last Shia so we could be with Imam Al-Qa'im. That's meant to be the Imam we rise up with. He rises with us, we rise with him. However, actions speak louder than words. And if the Imam has not entered the heart, you will not be able to state that the Qa'im is your Imam. Even if you can do it with your tongue, your heart can't do it. So your actions speak louder than your words. So we have to start living life, living by the words of the Imams, the code of conduct of the Imams, the way that the Ahlul Bayt want us to be, because Imam al-Sadiq he says to us, don't be of those people that make people look at us in disgrace. Be of the people that when they see you, they say, ah, look at the... Shia of Jafar. Look at the Shia of Jafar as Sadiq, Jafar ibn Muhammad. That's them. He wants us to be a pride for him. Right? And he says, Call to our way, Kunu da'watan lana bighayri al sinatikum. Call to our way by methods other than your tongues. So it's not about what we say. It's not about, I love Imam al Hussein. I love. Safinatun Najat. Yes, he is Misbah al Huda. But you're the one who carries the Misbah. The one who has to carry the lantern. He gives you the light, but you walk with the lantern. The lantern doesn't walk on its own. So, on this path, a path of servitude, a path of combat against the lower self, spiritual combat, it's not an easy path. And I know that I've been giving advice that is aiming quite high. That's on purpose. Because we're supposed to be trying to aim high if we are going to be of the Shia. Because you know when the Imams talk about the Shia? They have some hectic requirements. That we don't always follow. 51 rik'ahs a day. Right? That we want to get towards, to grow. To at least wear the, the finger on the right hand, on the ring on the right hand. And the finger on the right hand is one of the signs of the Shia to do the ziyara of the Arba'een one of the signs of the Shia but Imam Ali السلام, in Khutbat Al-Muttaqeen speaks a lot about his true followers there is a letter that he writes to Malik Al-Ashtar that if you are to read you can see what he wants of his followers an amazing letter if all you have in your life is the Quran and this letter, you're good because this letter says one, two, three, how to be in life. That's what the Imam wants from you. But there are some hectic requirements. So know 
that on this path, we have to put effort. If it's hard, it's supposed to be hard. You have to put effort. You have to challenge yourself. It's not going to happen easily. Because we're coming towards the last night now. On the first night, I spoke about the worldview and paradigm of the Muslim. The way in which you see the world. And if you see the world the same way that a kafir sees the world, and the only difference is that you move up and down five times a day, and that you sometimes don't, inshallah, all the times you don't eat pork and you don't drink alcohol and all those things. If that's the only difference between you and a kafir person, a person that does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the way in which you see the world is the way he sees the world, and business is the number one thing on your mind, and business is the number one thing on their mind, and lust is the number one thing on your mind, and lust the number one thing on their mind, and all you say is, I love Abu Abdullah, it's not enough. It's not enough. You have to at least repent, at the very least. At the very least. To say, I'm going to try to be better, Ya Allah, I won't do this again, and be resolute in your decision. This is the minimum that the Imam deserves from us. So on this path of trying to reach Iman, where knowledge is settled into the heart, the Urafa, they advise us to go through three main methods to discipline the soul. The methods of Musharata, Muraqaba, and Muhasaba. Musharata is to place conditions on the self, Muraqaba is to observe the self, and Muhasaba is to take the self into account. We have to do this every day. We place a condition on the self first. So if there's an action that we need to stop doing, we begin from here. We look at that action and we say, okay, today I place a condition on myself that I will not go back to this action. It might not even be haram. Maybe you've gone beyond now the haram. Maybe it's haram. But you don't want to do this thing anymore. Don't think about it in terms of forever. Think about it in terms of today. Today, I won't do so and so action. Even the person who's addicted to smoking in Ramadan, they know that today, at the end of the day, I can smoke. So for the whole day, I won't smoke. When usually, they'll go through a pack a day. But because they said today, I won't, day by day, they won't smoke. Now, shaitan's going to come and play with you now. He's going to play with your mind and say, who are you kidding? You do this every day. You can't stop. You've promised so many times. That's when you seek refuge in Allah from the whispers of Satan. You seek refuge and do la'na on shaitan. Allah. Remove him from your sight. And don't think that you can't achieve a stage where you no longer sin. That stage is achievable. You don't say it's just ma'soom. As far as I know, Sayyidah Zainab is not ma'soomah. And Abfadl Abbas is not of the 14. But I have a hard time imagining him sinning. Of course, they are great, great figures. But great figures are there to be emulated. So why should I shy away from that? Why do I look to it and say, but he's masoom, or no, he's Abu Fadl Abbas. No, look at it in another way. You have to try your best to be as much like them as possible. When I say the word khanzir, or pig, or pork, do any of you feel hungry? Is there any temptation? Zero. Since we were kids, in, in the Arab language, when you say khanzir, which means pig, you feel kind of, you feel disgusted. Not only do you not feel tempted, you feel like this is a derogatory thing to say. It feels bad. You feel bad when someone says it. You are masoom from eating khanzir. You are masoom from eating pork. It doesn't even come to your mind. It's not a temptation at all. A lot of people, they love English breakfast. You don't even care. Why? Because since you were young, everyone around you, your family, your society, your community, everyone knows we don't do that, and that's disgusting. So you grew up believing that. So it's not a temptation. What if other sins around you were regarded as such? That when you grew up, you saw them in that way. What if haram music, for example, when you were growing up, was seen that way? There may not be a temptation for you. 
or any other such sin that's normalized now. You can achieve that. There's an example right there. That's part of mastery that we spoke about a few nights ago. Mastery, malaka. It became a malaka. You have to make this a malaka for you, where you don't sin. Then you can begin to fly. You can't fly before stopping sinning. So you stop sinning first. Make the condition on the self. I won't do this action. Then you go into musharata. Musharata, afwan. You go into muraqaba. We finished musharata, we're in muraqaba. In muraqaba, which is observing the self now. I made my promise to myself. And when you make a promise to yourself, you must keep that promise. It's the most important promise you can ever make, I promise you. Because if you break your own promise to your own self, you will lose respect for yourself. You will call yourself names in your head. So even if the whole world respects you, and you don't respect yourself, you will not feel like an honorable human being. You'll feel miserable. Because you feel like a hypocrite at all times. They all think I'm good, but they don't even know that I lie to my own self. And when you promise yourself and you keep the promise to yourself, you know who you are, you're sure of yourself, so you have respect for yourself. So even if other people try to bring you down, you know that you're honest with your own self. Respect yourself first. So when you make a promise to yourself, keep it. It's the worst person to break the promise of. Because you no longer respect yourself, you bring yourself down, you lose confidence, you won't look at yourself in an honorable way, you will start to act in ways that you don't respect yourself because you say, I'm not respectable anyway, so you fall down, a snowball effect. So keep your promise to yourself and now observe to keep that promise throughout the day. Am I keeping the promise? Muraqaba means you have to notice even the small things that people don't usually notice. You have to look around and realize which one of my friends is bringing me down. Unfortunately, sometimes your friends bring you down. If my friend's not good for me, I can't be around them. It's a tough decision to make. Don't think I'm going to change them. You, go, you have to change yourself first. You can't change someone before you give yourself guidance. Go and work on yourself. Shaitan will trick you again. He'll say, you're good now. Go back. Go back to that place. You go back to that place, they misguide you again. Don't get excited that now you're saved. It takes time. You have to make a decision to remove yourself from those places and those people. You know where the analogy of the bad apple comes from? If you have 10 good apples, one bad apple, you put them in a bag, next day you have 11 bad apples. You have to be careful what's around you. You have to be careful what's normalized. In our madrasas, unfortunately, in many schools, <coughs> you'll find little girls and boys reading that book, 50 something something, right? Sold out. Why? Do we not look at which books they read? Do we not look at what they watch? What our children watch? You know your children, when they're born, they're born completely pure. Completely. Any corruption comes from the outside. Something they saw, something they heard. Any corruption. You know, I know certain people, in, in Lebanon for example, um, when it comes to my nephews and my nieces, when we bring babysitters home, even to this point, and this is not to cause offense to anyone that doesn't follow this rule, inshallah one day Allah will give you guidance to follow this following rule. But to the point that I don't even want my nieces to ask the question, and their parents are the ones who set the precedent, and I really respect them for it. We have a hard time finding a nanny, because the only nannies that are allowed to take care of them have to wear hijab. Because we don't even want our daughters to ask, oh, someone doesn't even wear hijab? You don't have to know that right now. Every woman around you wears hijab. That's what she sees. So when she's nine years old, that's all she knows. She knows that's the asl, that's the norm. Let me protect that. Why should, I, why should I remove that from her? Why should I take that away from her? Let her see that that's the norm. Let me put her in. I know in, a, in this community is, it's difficult in the West. But at least people who are, we allow into our homes to take care of our kids at least. I'm not saying in the streets. I'm saying people who have a connection with our children, with our young boys and girls. To protect their eyes, protect their ears. To watch whatever it is you'd allow them to watch before they watch it. Because you'd be surprised what they have on TV shows now. The nicest, most random storylines, beautiful characters. But they'll put nine good things, one bad thing. 
and people won't notice that. You know, and I can cite so many of these movies, but I don't want to take over the lecture with these types of movies. That they're good movies, and they're entertaining, and they're nice, and they're cute, but they infiltrate slowly. You have to be really careful. I'm not telling you to be paranoid. You be balanced. You be balanced, inshallah. We have a, a real conversation, honest conversation with our children, so they don't think that we're people that don't want them to see the world. No, no, I'll see the world with you. I'll travel with you. We'll go around with you. Notice how when the girl is nine years old, she's so happy to wear hijab. And when she's 13, she's like, I want to take it off. What changed in those four years? What changed? She left her parents' house. That's it. She started going more to school, mixing around with other girls, seeing different things. She was like, you know what? I don't want this. SubhanAllah, the purity of the nine-year-old girl compared to the 14-year-old, sometimes the same girl it would be, you'd see there's a difference. What happened? The outside world can contaminate her really easily. And may Allah bless your daughters. May Allah bless your sons. I know that I am I'm, I'm speaking somewhat, maybe someone would say it idealistically right now. But Wallah, it's not idealistic. I'm only telling you what I'm doing with my own daughter. Okay? And I'm going to put all efforts that I can to make sure she's better than me. Otherwise, I don't want to have a family. You know, there's, there's no point for me to have a family. That's how I see it. Except for to, to build a family for Imam al-Mahdi. I'm not going to settle for mediocrity. So it's not idealistic. It's something that I'm telling you that I'm planning to do. I'm, I'm saying it with you guys. I'm saying, talking to, my, to myself first. This is a lot of effort, but it's something that we have to do. In our narrations, they say, the father must teach the child Qur'an. Okay? Not the Qur'an teacher. So we bring Qur'an teacher because they're skilled. That's good. But you must also have Qur'an sessions with your children as fathers. Because that's where they see the knowledge come from. Don't let them see their fathers as someone who doesn't know about religion. Why should your child know more about the Qur'an than you do? Why should they have more surahs memorized than you do? Because they go to madrasa, but you're at work. No, no. Let the child see. This is how I am with the Qur'an, my son, my daughter. This is how you must be. You know, we have to have this kind of relationship with our children. Have muraqabah. Be careful what goes into their eyes and their ears, what goes into your eyes and your ears. Be very careful. Because it's all around you. So you have to put maximum effort. You know the shaitan, my brothers and sisters. They are everywhere. I know it's scary, but it's true. It's a sad truth that I dislike speaking about. But that's the truth. And if you want to go on this journey, you have to come to terms with that truth. So we, we have to take care of each other. We have to. We move on to muhasaba. Muhasaba, that final that final stage where you take yourself into account what did I do today? list down four or five things every day would list five things that he was thankful for and he would enter a state of gratitude and do hamd wa shukr then he would write five things he was regretful for sin or not something he could have done better even if it's a sin it's obvious you write it down you do istighfar before you sleep. The 11th Imam, he says that the ones who do not take themselves into account, they're not from our Shia. They're not from us. So we must take ourselves into account. We can't settle for mediocrity. Day by day, we take ourselves into account. So on this path, every day, musharata, muraqaba, and muhasaba. Then, maybe we can be loyal Loyal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Loyal to everything He's given us Loyal to Allah And we learn loyalty From Abu Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam The way he was so loyal to Imam al Hussein. You know Shimr bin Dil Jawshan la'anahu Allah Was a cousin of Abu Fadl al-Abbas from the side of his mother Related to Ummul Banin He told the camp He told Umar ibn Sa'd That's my cousin Him and his brothers Maybe we can go and save Them from our tribe So Shimr approached The camp of Abu Abdullah Before the battle 
and he offered of all people a Fadl Abbas sanctuary. He told him, come with us and nothing will happen to you. Fadl Abbas laughed at him. You coward. You disgrace me by talking to me like this. Go back. It wouldn't even be a second thought on his mind that he didn't have to if he was treacherous. A'udhu Billah. Abu Fadl Abbas always knew his destiny. Abu Abdullah always knew his destiny. When they were moving towards Kufa and Hur stopped them on the way and told them they must lay camp here, Abu Abdullah asked, What land is this? And some of his companions answered, This land they call it Nainawa. So the Imam asked again, What land is this? Another companion said, They call this land Al Ghadiriya. A third companion said, Afwan, a third time the Imam said, What land is this? A third companion answered, Karbala. The Imam, when he heard that word, he said, I know this land. This is the land. This is the land my father told me about. My brothers set up camp. This is the land where we will be killed where our women will be taken captives where we meet our final destiny day by day as they set up camp more and more enemy soldiers would join the forces of Umar ibn Sa'd 1,000 5,000 10,000 20,000 30,000 by some accounts and Abu Abdullah is in this Small circle of tents with 70 to 100 people, 70 to 100 men, warriors. When Imam al Hussein was there and there were only two to three hundred enemy warriors, the Imam said, I wish not to be the one who begins the battle. He offered them water. He offered them water. He gave his enemies water. Now, Umar bin Sa'ad had made sure to guard the river, to guard the Euphrates. No water was allowed to enter the camp of Abu Abdullah. The water was cut off for a few days leading into the 7th of Muharram. So it was cut off before the 7th. 5th, 6th, 7th, no water. On the 7th day, most people do not know about this account. On the seventh day, Abu Abdullah calls Abu Fadl Abbas. This is a narration. It's not a story from the person speaking. This is a riwayah. He tells Abu Fadl Abbas, I want you to take the warriors and bring water back to the camp because the kids keep screaming, Al Atash, Al Atash. Ya Abbas, can you get the water? Abu Fadl says, of course, I'll bring the water back. My father used to call me As-Saqi. They called him that before Karbala, because water brings life. Abu Fadl quenches the thirst of life. Abu Fadl comes towards the army, he gathers them all, and they go towards the river bank. Abu Fadl takes care of the right side, and Ali al-Akbar takes care of the left side. 170 to 100 warriors. They move forward towards the bank, but they stay behind. Abu Fadl sends in a man by the name of Nafi'. Nafi', a companion of the Imam. Nafi' walks, and then he says to one of the soldiers, Can I have a sip of water? And the soldier says, Yes, you can. Come. And Nafa says, I wish to take some back to give Abu Abdullah. He says, that you can't do. Why? Because he's a son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's not allowed to drink. He's a treacherous man. You would allow me to drink, but you won't allow my master Hussein to drink. They actually were saying they'd allow him to drink, but not Imam Hussein. 
He said, how can I drink if Abu Abdullah can't drink? So, a small skirmish ensued. As soon as that happened, Abu Fadl Abbas organized it so that the two battalions went and started fighting against the guardians of the river. As they were fighting, then Abu Fadl pierced the middle with the brothers behind him. He had a group that were in the middle. Two battalions and then they were behind. They go in the middle and then they filled up the water whilst the others were fighting off the guardians. They killed several soldiers and not one of them died in that battle. That was the first battle in Karbala. He brought the water back on the day, on the seventh day. He brought water back to the tents, which most people don't know. He brought water back and he gave the water to Sukaina. So when on the tenth Sukaina told all the other children, Uncle Abbas will definitely bring the water, it's because It's because she already knew He did it before He'll do it again Sallallahu alayka ya sayyidi Ya mawla Ya abba Thirty years before the battle of Karbala, Ummul Bani gives birth to a healthy young boy. Imam Ali takes the boy into his arms. He kisses the boy on his forehead. He begins to kiss his feet Then he kisses his hands But when he'd kiss his hands He would stay close to them he would keep his face in the hands of this baby Ummul Banina Ya Mawlai, is this baby healthy? Why do you keep kissing his hands? The Imam says, this baby is healthy. This baby is more than healthy. This baby will represent me on a day when I won't be there. This baby will protect the son of Fatima. But these hands, he will protect Hussein with these hands until they're cut from his body. Zainab walked in Father, I feel so much love for this young boy What will you name him? Imam Ali says, I will call him Abbas He's my gift to you, Ya Zainab Zainab took Abbas in her arms Abbas, what a beautiful name Imam Ali said, he is for you and you are for him, Ya Zainab He will go where you will go, Ya Zainab Abu Fadl was raised in the house of his father just before Imam Ali left this world after he gave the amana to everyone 
and the wasiyah to follow Imam Al Hassan. He called Abu Fadl and he called Zainab. Now Abu Fadl, a young man, so handsome and so tall, broad shoulders. Zainab would stand behind him. He was her protector and her flag. And he put the hand of Zainab in Abbas's hand. And he said to Abbas, Ya Abbas, I leave Zainab to you. Protect your sister when I'm not there. I trained you well, my son. I trust you with their lives. On the day of Ashura, the day had finally come. The day that Abbas was born for. Abbas. People would mistake him for his father on the battlefield. But today he could not fight. He would watch as one by one the companions would go out to fight. And he kept clenching his fists and asking his master, never calling him brother, Mawlai Ya Hussein, will you allow me to go to discipline these disbelievers? I cannot take them hurting our companions. Ya Abbas, you are my backbone, you are my flag, you are my entire army. As long as you hold the flag, Ya Abbas, as long as you hold the alam, it means we're still standing. Stay with me, brother. Then Ali al-Akbar went out to fight. Abbas saw his nephew slain on the battlefield. Frustration and anger built in his heart. But he would not do anything his master did not allow him to. Abbas even endured watching his nephew Qasim. He dressed Qasim with a huge armor and gave Qasim his sword. But Abbas still could not unsheathe his own sword. And he would hear the screams from the tents because the water had been cut off. The water he'd brought on the seventh day had run out. For several times, the children would scream, al atash al and Sukaina would scream, Al Atash. Amma ya Abbas, can you bring water for us again? The children keep asking me because they know if I ask you, you never turn away my request. Abu Father. Felt so much pain in his heart. He went once again and said, Ya Mawla, if he will not allow me to fight, please will you allow me to bring water for the children? <laughs> Imam al Hussein granted Abbas permission. 
Abu Fadl went into the tent. As soon as he entered the tent, the children all ran to him. And they grabbed his legs. And they grab his clothes and call him Ammar Abbas Salata Salata We're so thirsty Abbas would touch all of their heads They are all orphan children now Then he looked up and saw Zayna He told them, I will come back with the water because Zainab on her head. I will be back soon, sister. He left the tent and he looked Imam al Hussein in his eyes. And Abu Abdullah looked back and they did not say a word. Then he held the flag <laughs> And he mounted his horse <laughs> And he set out into the battlefield and Al Abbas ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Whoever stepped in his way was immediately struck down. Reports suggest he killed over 80 warriors on his way to the river. They began to cower and run from Abu Fadl. Much too powerful for the army They would retreat Whenever they approached Until no one stood in his way And Abbas was the only one Who could reach the river on that day And he stepped off of his horse And he put his hands Into the cold water And he lifted his hands up to his face And he saw the water glisten And he threw the water back into the river Ya Nafs min ba'd al huni Oh Nafs, you are nothing after Hussain how can I drink when my Mawla cannot drink? La Wallah, that's not the way of the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. How can I drink when the daughter of my Mawla, when Sakina cannot drink? He fills the water into the container And he carries the flask in his arms And he mounts the horse once again And he charges towards the camp He sees in the distance He sees Abu Abdullah waiting and next to him, Sukaina is waiting. And Imam al Hussein's hands on the shoulders of Sukaina. And she turns back and tells them, I told you he'll bring the water. And she looks back towards Abu Fadl in the distance. He sees nothing else. He sees only the camp The water is in my hands I just have to get there I just have to get them the water I'm almost there On the way The enemy is hid behind the trees 
And as Abu Fadl came towards the camp, an enemy jumped up from behind the tree and struck down the left arm of Abbas. The left arm was caught. It dropped to the ground and the blood began to spill. Abu Fadl looked towards the hand. He left it behind and kept going on the horse. I'm almost there. He paid no attention to the pain until the enemy started to catch up with him. Another Mal'oon struck down his sword. As he approached Abu Fadl, he struck his sword onto the right arm of Abbas. And the arm was caught onto the ground. Abu Fadl, without any arms, held the flag close to his chest. As long as I can get to the camp, I can give the water to the children. Abu Fadl kept going towards the camp until an arrow was shot towards him and the arrow pierced the water container and the water spilled out Abbas looked at the container as the water hit the ground and his heart hit the ground with the flaws he suddenly stopped. <laughs> How do I go back without any water? A man came from behind him and with a spear he slammed it onto the head of our boss. Abu Fadl fell to the ground off from his horse the flag fell he had no arms to block the fall as he tried to get up a man shot an arrow into his eye no arms a wounded head and one eye and the enemy surrounded him he tries to use his legs to defend himself but they began to stab him from every angle and he called out Mawla Ya He sends his final salam with his last breath. Imam al Hussein saw his final soldier fall. He ran into the battlefield and the enemies flee. Imam al Hussein unmounted his horse and he began to walk towards Abu Fadl. As he approached, Abbas heard footsteps coming. He could not move. He was completely blinded by the blood. He was in pieces, breathing his last breath. He heard footsteps approach. He said, Oh man, before you kill me, allow my master to bid his farewell to me. <laughs> Habibi Abbas, it's me, Hussein. He took his head into his lap. 
Abba, speak to me, brother. What did they do to you, brother? Abbas doesn't say one word. He just moves his head onto the ground. <laughs> ya Abbas. Imam al Hussein takes his head once again and puts it in his lap. Ya Abbas, speak to me. Why do you move away from me? Abu Fadl replied, Mawlai, my head is now in your lap. But in a few moments, Mawlai, in whose lap will your head be? I cannot accept something for myself if my master will be alone. I wish I could stay with you, Mawla. Abbas, I have one request before you leave, Habibi. Abbas says, tell me with my last breath I will do what you wish, Mawlai. He says, Abbas, let me hear you say the word, brother. Call me Akhi just once in your life. So Abbas says, I also have a request. He says, Akhi, ya Hussain, my brother, don't take me back to the tent. Brother, I don't want Zainab to see me this way. Brother, tell Sukaina I tried my best. Wallah, I tried my best. Akhi, akhi, akhi. Leave me on the grounds of Karbala. Assalamu alayka ya Abba Abdullah. And Abbas took his last breaths and his soul left this world. Imam Hussein stayed there. He did not move with Abbas in his arms. Al Al Kasar Dahri. My back has finally been broken. Abbas, how could you leave? Without you, I have no army. Ya Hussein, ya Wahi. Abbas, ya sanadi, sadiqi ya labdi, wada'an ya adudi, ya rukni fi shidadi, Abbas, ya sanadi, min ba'di kash ta'alat, Ruhi wa ma sakanat Wa zainabu duribat Wa badaha subiat Min badi kashtalat Ruhi wa ma sakanat 
Imam al Hussein returned to the tent. Sukaina just watched her father. Zainab walked out. And Imam al Hussein told Zainab that Abbas will not be coming back to the tent. Wah, Abbas, Wah, Akha. Inna lillah, wa inna ilayhi raji'ud. Wa la'natullah ala al-dhalimin. إلى يوم القيامة يا حسين